Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have been bringing this service together seamlessly. And that we can see your spirit guiding from the opening prayer. That Jesus Christ would be the center and the focus and the very impetus of all that we do. We thank you that you are here, Holy Spirit. It is your ministry to illuminate and to shine a light on the truth that is Christ. To exalt him and him only. So as we come to your word, we ask that you would continue to minister amongst us. That we would know Christ more, desire him more, and live for him better. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Last week, Pastor Nate finished the last sermon in the topical series of what are the healthy marks of a church. That is, what are those distinguishing factors that we can look at that say that church is on the road to spiritual health. Now, it's not an exhaustive list as we've talked about before, but they are the key elements that a biblical church must continue to strive after if they're going to get it right. They are expository preaching, biblical theology, the gospel, conversion, evangelism, membership, discipleship, discipline, and leadership, biblical leadership. All of these things the church needs to be striving for. Again, they're biblical principles that are a sign of spiritual health for the local church. If I was to go to a doctor this afternoon, I'd get an examination. He'd start from the top and work down. He'd look at my eyes and check my reflexes and go through a whole series of evaluations, all with the one desire to see how healthy I am at that moment. And that's what these nine marks do. They're indicators of good teaching line by line, chapter by chapter, book by book. But this year marks the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And so we're going to spend five weeks specifically examining the foundational truths upon which the found, uh, Reformation was founded. The, the five truths for which people gave up their lives... Because of their faith, they were persecuted and burned. We're going to do that all with the eye of, of not simply remembering and celebrating what God has done in the past to recuperate the gospel, but with an understanding that these are principles that we must fight for and live out today in our day and age too. They're things that we must contend with as a church so that's why we have the banners here, the Reformation 500. That's why Dr. Michael Haken is coming next month. And I want to encourage you, he is a very well-known, very good speaker. He's internationally renowned. So he's coming here for one uh, evening. There's going to be uh, treats uh, and there's going to be daycare. So please invite uh, your friends. But again, typically we would go into a... Uh, an expository sermon series, but we're going to look at the Reformation. Because in the Reformation, the principles that stand, that they were fighting for, that they were desiring after, they define the gospel. They're not secondary issues. They're not of lesser importance. They actually make the gospel what the gospel is, the good news of salvation. So here's the reality. If we lose those principles of the Reformation, we lose the gospel. So there are things that we must fight for, we must hold to. So between the series on the healthy marks of a biblical church and the series on remembering the Reformation and why it's important, that is, what we've studied past and what we're going to study in the near future, we have today. It's kind of a hinge day between the two. 
but I wanted to focus on a biblical principle that naturally connects these two things. The, rem the remembrance of the importance of the Reformation as well as the marks of a healthy church. It's something that developed out of the Reformation. It's called Semper Reformanda, or always reforming, always being reformed. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. And as you're doing that, I just want to remind you what you undoubtedly already know about Psalm 119. It's a wonderful praise song to God. It celebrates the gift of the Torah, or His covenantal instructions to His people. Now, these instructions throughout the whole uh, psalm are sometimes called the commandments, the instructions, the testimonies, the statutes, the laws. Well, but they are all synonyms for the revealed Word of God. And Psalm 119 is comprised of 22 stanzas, each one with eight verses. And each stanza starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So this morning, the verses that we're looking at, the fifth stanza, so it starts with the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it starts with the letter He. So let's just read these verses again. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things, and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your, pro your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts, in your righteousness, give me life. Now because we're looking at the fifth stanza of, of this psalm, and, and the fifth stanza starts with the letter what? K, the fifth letter of the alphabet. It's important to understand that when this letter is prefixed or added to the beginning of a verb, it gives it a very special meaning in the original. It, 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 it's what's called a causative. Now, it, it may not seem important, but here's the important part. In, in English, we'd say, Cause me, O Lord, to learn your ways that I may keep your statutes. Cause me to understand. Cause me not to look upon worthless things. And it's important because it, it doesn't happen just once. There's only a small number of verses, and there are nine verbs that this little word he is attached to, to each one. Meaning that every time that it is used, it's saying, cause me to walk in your paths. Now, our English Bible translates it as, as a plea unto God, as a supplication. And that's right. But there's a little bit of a loss of the translation there. There's, there's an intensity in the original. The, the psalmist isn't simply crying out to God, Help me, O Lord. He's saying and he recognizing that only God is the one who is able to perform that what he needs. He's saying, Only you can help me. Cause me to understand because I can't understand in my own, uh, with my own mind. Cause me to walk in your paths because I'm unable to take even one step on my own. Cause my eyes not to work or look on the worthless and vain things in the world because that's naturally what they're doing all the time. Do you catch the difference? The, the subtlety there? It is a plea unto God, but it's also recognition that it's only God that can change the physical reality of who He is. He desires that change, and He says, Come, come, help me understand. These are the words of Paul in Philippians 2.13, isn't it? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work His good pleasure. And see, here's the, the difference. The man or the woman of God who has come to a saving relationship in Jesus Christ sees themselves for who they are before a holy God. 
They are a person who has been saved by grace. They are a person who is in constant need of grace every moment of every day as we have already sung. But they are also a people who needs to be schooled in the ways of God. In and of ourselves, we are incapable of understanding and growing in godliness. And that, we hear from these verses, comes from the word of God. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's because you have been washed with your, uh, your, your sins have been washed away, and you now have a right relationship with God. Your natural response, if you're a child of God, is, I want more of you. Teach me what that means. And that's exactly what we read in the psalmist. There's a sincere desire to know God more intimately. But he knows he lacks the ability and the understanding in and of himself to do that. So he cries out to God and he cries out and asks for four things very specifically. Verse 34. First one is the mind. Give me understanding that I may keep your law. Verse 35 talks about the feet. Lead me in the path of your commandments. Verse 37, the eyes. Turn my eyes away from worthless or vain things. And verse 36, the heart. Not simply meaning the seat of emotion, but meaning the whole person. Incline my heart towards your testimony. Incline every fiber of my being unto you, Lord God, for you are worthy of praise. You have saved me. So the first thing that we see in these verses is an all-consuming desire to know God through his word. But it's heightened by the, the understanding and the recognition that he is totally dependent upon God for any understanding and for any ability to glorify God. Let me say it again. First thing we see is an all-consuming desire to know God through his word, heightened by a recognition that he is totally dependent upon God for any knowledge. But why would the psalmist want his whole being, every fiber of who he is, inclined to God's word? Verses 37 and 40. Because he knows that it is life unto him. He knows that while God the Father is spirit, God has revealed himself in his testimonies. And if he is a, a true, sincere follower, a worshiper of God, he wants to submit every aspect, his whole being, to the teachings of God because they reveal who God the Father is and what he would desire of us. It's the story that Jesus gives us in Matthew 13, verses 44, isn't it? Of the man who finds a treasure in the field. He buries it again and goes home and sells literally everything he has and goes back and finds that field and purchases it for his own. The man or the woman of God who desires to know God, desires because they know a holy God has saved them from their sin. And their natural desire and tendency is to, I, I need more of you. Teach me what that means. So God's commandments help us to understand what is good and pleasing to God. God's statutes instruct us how to align our lives in ways that are in accord with the principles of God. So having experienced that fullness of salvation, the psalmist's all-consuming joy is what? To, again, submit every to God's teaching. <coughs> Why? Because it is life to him. And this is the second thing that we see in these verses. Since God's word is life to us, our natural reaction should be one of joyful submission our whole being to God through the word. To 
to have our minds molded by the truths that are in that. To have him determine every aspect of our lives so that we know that as we live, we glorify Christ. We are living in accord with his principles. And that's what always being reformed or always reforming is about. It's a continual submission to the teaching of the Word of God. It's Again, it's Romans 12, 21, isn't it? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we come to the Word of God, we submit our will, we submit our emotions, we submit our desires to it, that it may change us. As we learn to submit to it, it rewires, it hotwires our sinful programming so that who we are, what we desire, what we think, how we live is all determined by the principles laid out by God in his word and not our sinful default setting. So the term always reforming or always being reformed is really a passive. We are being reformed by the word. We'll get to that in a minute. It, it wasn't one of the five pillars or what we call the solas of the Reformation because it comes out of the Reformation. It was a principle that the, the reformers were following, but it was really synthesized by the generation who came after it who looked at the, the gains that happened in the Reformation and were worried that the gospel was going to be lost again. And so this motto came to be, always being reformed. Now, the reformers didn't believe that they were teaching anything new. Nothing that they were espousing was radically new. It had existed in the church before. For them, it was just something that had been lost, that had been refound again. They didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what, it's the dawn of a new day. It's a new age. The age of enlightenment is here. So we need to redefine the gospel of Jesus Christ to fit a new generation. That's not what they did, although sometimes we tend to think that way. Rather, what they said was the church has wandered away from biblical truth. And it needs to be reformed according to the purposes set down in the word of God. So as these men sat and studied, they themselves were transformed by the word and their principles became the, the, the start of the Protestant Reformation. It was a, a fire that was lit that would cross Europe. Now, you may have thought it was funny that I said that the, the reformers didn't wake up one morning and said, it's a new day, a new generation, and we've got to figure out a way to make this gospel of Jesus Christ applicable to the Age of Enlightenment. But that's how many of us think today, unfortunately. Many people, many churches, many denominations, they rally around the term always reforming as a rally for change. And I was reading just the other day how one of the denominations in the United States about 15 years ago explicitly took up this motto and then moved away from biblical principles to say, we're always reforming the gospel so that it meets our new generation but it misses the principle altogether. They tend to say things like, well, we live in a vastly different world than Jesus walked in the first century, so we need to update the church. We need to deal with the new realities of the 21st century. We can't preach the same gospel. They'll say, well, people are less receptive to the gospel, so we need to, to change the way we do church. Or, you know what, those ethical principles that we used to hold to, they're, they're old-fashioned, they're, they're out of date, they're out of sync with our culture today. So we need to redefine what morality is. Always reforming does not mean that the church must continually adjust to the reality of the world so that it can be relevant. Always reforming does not mean that we are to tweak biblical truths Things that have stood for centuries, even millennia, because we somehow think that we are a gentler, more enlightened culture today. Always reforming means that 
that the church must be continually transformed by the eternal truth of God's word. We must be conformed to its truth and not vice versa. And it's a process that's, that's ongoing. It's never ending, isn't it? We need to be continually transformed according to God's purposes and by his word. And this is where the rubber meets the road for us this morning, brothers and sisters. Not only are people in our culture today, churches and whole denominations, saying that we must reinterpret what the Bible teaches about morality to be relevant, many good-intentioned churches are saying things like, we must redefine basic spiritual truths so that we can be relevant to our culture around us. We shouldn't be teaching that Jesus Christ had to die for sinners. We shouldn't be teaching that God is a holy God and he is a, a holy wrath against sinners and that there is a penalty for sin which must be paid for. They believe that the church needs to be reformed or redefined to be relevant to the world around it. So that everything that's done in the past is really up for grabs. It doesn't really matter what we believed in before. We need to redefine what the gospel is for today. And, and it really comes out uh, of a postmodern mindset that says, and, and most of us, a lot of us here come out of that, that mindset, it's a rejection that God has a plan that starts in Genesis and goes to the end of eternity. It's a rejection that there is truths that are always true. It's a rejection of the traditional church. Under the guise of always reforming, they leave behind the principles that have stood for centuries, biblical truths, and they call it progress. And that's the reason why we as pastors decided we needed to preach what are the biblical marks of a healthy church? If you were to go and visit a church, if you were to go and be looking at where you wanted to reallocate your family, to settle down, how would you know that this is a church that is following basic principles? How would you know that it's truly healthy? Why is biblical, uh, counsel, or sorry, biblical understanding of conversion important? Do they truly understand what the gospel is? Do they practice expository preaching? So in a world that's becoming more chaotic, more antagonistic to a biblical truth, our task is not to change to become more tolerable to the world, but to know with greater assurance what God's word demands of us if we are truly saved. What we are to think, how we are to live, so that as we live in this dark day, we bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. The task of always reforming is a spiritual truth that every believer of every generation must wrestle with and contend with in their own personal lives if they earnestly desire to glorify God. Why? Because our natural fallen tendency is what? It's not to seek after God, not to glorify Him in all things with our whole heart. We're prone to wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We have short memories. Do you remember the day of your salvation and the joy and the blessedness of having your sins forgiven? Our tendency, verse 37, is to seek after worthless and vain things. Our eyes need to be trained in righteousness. Our hearts need to be trained in grace. Our very will needs to be submitted to the Word of God. Now at this time of year, we have both basketball and hockey playoffs going on. And I was thinking this morning early, I know we have some raving fans here. 
If I was to call you up five minutes before a hockey game and say, let's go have a Bible study, <laughs> what's going to be your response? <laughs> Now, the Word of God tells us that this is a vain and worthless thing. Not that that doesn't bring some pleasure and engagement here and now, but it has no lasting, eternal value in it. And while it's not wrong to want to watch a playoff game, we need to ask ourselves, do we have as much passion to turn to the Word of God as to turn on the television watch who wins. That's our natural tendency, is to seek after those things and not the Word. Things that are vain, are worthless, because they're really of no eternal spiritual value. It's too easy, brothers and sisters, to be conformed to the world, to become complacent in our spiritual walk, to forget the biblical truths that have guided the church for centuries, to succumb to the worldview of the culture around us and say, you know what, those things just aren't that important to redefine the gospel. It's a spiritual necessity that is ours because we are still sinners, even though we're saved by grace. It is ours until Christ comes or he calls us home. The task of always reforming is a spiritual reality that all of those who are truly saved would earnestly desire after. Because they have known the beauty and the wonder of, of having their sins forgiven by a holy God and understanding the payment that was necessary for that, the death of Jesus Christ. So we should desire, Lord, we're yours. Come and transform us. But is that really our heart's desire? The word of God is not a burdensome, tedious obligation. It is to be a spiritual joy because in there we know that there is life. In there we know that God has revealed his glory and his righteousness and asks us to walk joyfully with him that we might glorify him in all things. So I, I want to challenge you this morning because as a church we're at a crossroad. God has blessed us for 50 years, but I... I fear the next 50 years are going to be more dangerous, more treacherous for us. We just have to look at the world around us. Last week marked my eighth month with you as part of my family since I started here. I've been just trying to settle in, to get to know you, to find the rhythm of the church. But over the next few months, we as a church must earnestly seek God's direction for the future. I do not have a master blueprint that's come down from heaven indicating all of the ministries that we're supposed to be about and how we're supposed to do them. But I do know that as we seek God together, as we submit ourselves to God's word, allowing it to inform us, to reform us, to transform us, we will glorify God in whatever ministry, whatever task he calls us to. We need to remember and celebrate what transpired 500 years ago in the Reformation because there the gospel of Jesus Christ was rediscovered. We need to remember the biblical principles, the practices that are hallmarks of what a healthy gospel church is supposed to be alike. We need to be people, families, a church who are wholeheartedly committed to the glory of God and in that are continually submitting ourselves to the power, the transforming power of the Word of God. Always reforming. 
always being reborn. How is your spiritual life? Because a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Do you desire earnestly to know God? When you read the word in the morning, spend a, a couple minutes with it, is it to get a spiritual buzz to get you through the day? Or is it to ask God to transform you? Do you say, Lord, open my eyes that I may understand because I can't understand. Help me to do what you ask me to do because that's not what I want to do. Help my heart to receive it with joy. Change me. Is that what we want? We serve an amazing God. Here is the master, the creator, the redeemer. There is nothing in this universe that he is not, even at this very second, in control of and knows every facet of. And yet he has loved us by sending his son Jesus Christ to die for us. He has saved us from our sinfulness. He has brought us into a family. And very specifically this morning, the emphasis is he has not left us abandoned to our own devices. Learn how to walk in holiness all by yourself because I'm up here waiting for you. He has given us his eternal word and in it there is life for us. In it. We can know how to love God, how to worship Him, how to glorify Him in all things. Our greatest desire should be to continually submit ourselves to it and say, change me. Help me not be the same person I was five minutes ago. Because I know my heart. And you are deserving of so much more. Our Heavenly Father, what a wonderful God you are. We look upon ourselves and we, I pray we recognize our shortcomings. And more than that, I pray that we are convicted by our shortcomings. That we need more of you every day. And the only way to do that, Lord God, is to submit ourselves to the truth, to the eternal word, because in there, there is life. We thank you that you love us so much that you guide in and through by the power of the Holy Spirit, transforming us more into the image of Christ every day. Cause our wills to be submissive to you. In Jesus' name.